please like and subscribe. What an honour to have the brilliant Mehdi Hassan, who I love to bits, even though he fled the country back in 2015, <laughs> as this country descended into the status, as I always say, of burning skip. So could have could have done with you here, Mehdi, I'll be honest with you. Anyway, he's got a new book out uh, called Win Every Argument, The Art of debating, persuading, and public speaking, which makes sense because there's no better, I would say, debater, persuader, and public speaker out there. Um, You're, very You're very kind. The check's in the mail. Um, Mehdi, right. Firstly, do obviously everyone get this book, which is a bestseller in the New York Times for the second week running. You, you cheeky, you cheeky git. Um, so let's just start. Actually, I, you know what? I don't want this to be a loving. All right. I know. Hey, I'm just, I just showered you with praise. Let's start slagging off the left before I talk to you about politics. The left is not very good at communicating, I would put it to you. The right is better at communicating. It can weave a story. It can emotionally appeal to people. Is that true and why? If so, is that true? It is true. It's something I genuinely believe. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Um, and the second chapter of the book is about the importance of feelings, not just facts. And that is aimed at the left-wing, progressive, liberal reader, journalist, politician, activist. Because let's be honest... When people on the left, and I'm using left very broadly, uh, try and make an argument, it is one that's very factual. It's one that's got lots of stats and figures and numbers and data. We love our data. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't want to turn into, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene or Andrew Bridgen with the crazy conspiracies about vaccines or whatever it is. We should be proud of the fact that empirical evidence still matters to us and that we can make factual cases and we do live in a reality-based universe. But... People are not just convinced by facts. The human brain doesn't work like that. Voters aren't moved to go out and vote for you because you've got a 17-point policy proposal. And I think that's been a problem for liberals and lefties on both sides of the Atlantic. I've seen it with the Labour Party. I've seen it with the Democratic Party here in the US for a long, long time. Now, what's the reason for that? I don't know. I, I've speculated. Is it the liberal arts backgrounds of a lot of people on the left uh, which makes them think, you know what, you know, the reasoned case, the Socratic method, that's the way we win. Is it the legal background of a lot of politicians? Keir Starmer, uh, the Hillary Clinton's, Barack Obama's of this world, the lawyers, the lawyerly approach to making a case, which is great in a courtroom, but not necessarily on the stump or on television. So I don't know why it is, uh, but the right certainly has worked out and worked out a while ago that you rouse people from their slumber. You get people mad. Uh, you get them angry, you get them, you know, the right place to the worst emotions, fear, paranoia, loathing, resentment, uh, inferiority complexes, insecurities. And I'm not telling the liberal left to do the same, but I am saying play to good emotions, play to hope, uh, inspire, uh, build solidarity, but for God's sake, appeal to people's hearts, not just their heads. It's like bringing a calculator to a knife fight, as the phrase goes. I mean, George Lakoff, the political linguist, makes this point. Yes. The left, the right use um, stories, emotional stories. The left often use facts and statistics. I suppose, do you think part of it is the left saying, well, we'll win through reason and that it's kind of demagogic populism to do anything else. But I suppose the point is you can make emotional arguments that aren't based on, A, appealing to the basis of emotions and B, based on lies. Yeah, and I think someone like Obama... Uh, was able to do that, was able, and I talk in the book about some of the stories he told, uh, the way he captured a crowd. And Tony Blair, not a person you or I are big fans of, um, but, to, you know, you have to go back in British politics probably to Blair uh, for a Labour leader who knew how to tell a story, who knew how to appeal to people's emotions, who knew how to feel his way towards victory, not just rationalise uh, his way towards victory. You look at Gordon Brown, who comes after him. You look at Ed Miliband. You look at Jeremy Corbyn and now Keir Starmer. And you, they don't have uh, those rhetorical skills. They don't have their finger on the emotional pulse in the way that a Blair did or an Obama did. And that's a problem because, as I say, the right is getting more demagogic is leaning even more into culture wars and emotional clashes. And you can't run away from that. You know, I say this all the time here in the US, the way to win a culture war is to fight it, not to run away from it. And the way to fight it is to have the right language to be able to capture your audience in the way that the right capture theirs. Now, because you abdicated your responsibilities in staying in Britain and um, having to languish- hey, I'm with... fighting some big battles over here, my friend. Well, some of us were stuck here under this government for 13 years of our life, Mehdi. And you, you pressed the escape button, you, you, you ejected. Just saying, on your conscience be it. 
But because of that, I'm going to ask you about the British government. Now, OK, the big thing in the news at the moment is about the uh, deportation um, yeah. of anyone who arrives in British shores. They might be an Afghan teenager whose father yeah. was shot dead by the Taliban. If they arrive on a boat, they're getting kicked out and they're banned from re-entering. It doesn't matter what their circumstances yeah. are. They've been raped, murdered, uh, sorry, raped, tortured, their relatives murdered. But the, the British government would say, look, we're from diverse backgrounds. We've got, unlike the Labour Party, uh, someone from a minority background who's our leader. Yeah. How dare anyone accuse us of racism? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, cudgel to wield uh, against the liberal left, especially given the Labour Party's manifest failures to do what the Tories have undeniably done, which is elect two women prime ministers in a way that Labour hasn't, uh, elect an Asian prime minister in the way that Labour hasn't. So that's an indictment of the Labour Party for a start. Um, but it's not just in the UK. I'm in the US, as you repeatedly mentioned. And Nikki Haley uh, is a brown politician, the daughter of Indian immigrants running for the Republican nomination. <laughs> Good luck. Trump will crush her. But she's running for the nomination and she announces her candidacy for president by bashing immigration, illegal immigration, you know, talking about the border and security, uh, because she can play that card and Republicans love having someone like that who can play that card. Look, what I would say very simply is, number one, the fact that you are brown is not a get out of jail free card when it comes to being racist. Uh, number two, the fact that they are brown is clearly uh, part of the strategy that is used to deflect from charges of racism. They cynically lean into that. I mean, if, if, if brown right wing politicians didn't mention the fact that they were brown, then fine, I wouldn't mention it either. But they do. I mean, take Sajid Javid. The guy spent his entire career saying, well, you know, I'm not a practicing Muslim. And the only religion practiced in my home is Christianity, which I totally respect, each to their own. But then when the Tory party is accused of Islamophobia, he turns up on the Sunday morning shows and says, well, as a Muslim, I can tell you the Tory party ain't so bad. Oh, hold on. That is cynical uh, in the extreme. And I think Braverman is someone who, uh, interestingly, people point out, well, her parents aren't refugees. Uh, they came legally. She said, at Tory party conference last year, Suella Braverman, Home Secretary, said, my father, I'm quoting her, was effectively kicked out of Kenya. Effectively kicked out of Kenya. So hold on. Your father was effectively kicked out of Kenya and was embraced by Britain and you got all these opportunities, but you are not going to help others who have been kicked out of their countries. That is fundamentally what's going on here. The hypocrisy is as brazen as it is nauseating. And I, for one, I hold brown people to a higher standard. So when people say, well, we've got a diverse government, okay then, then that's even worse that if it was an all white government, I wouldn't be as mad as I am now when I see them behaving in this way towards people on those boats who are Eritreans, who are Sudanese, who are Syrian, who are Iraqi, who are Afghan. They're not Ukrainian. Uh, by and large. Um, and yet this government says, um, oh, the other thing, Owen, that really pisses me off is when they say the children of immigrants who are on the right who start bashing immigration, they say, well, our parents, they came legally, not like these people today, which of course is the drawbridge mentality. We're here, no one else. But it's also flat false, right? Your parents came legally because the legal channels existed. You're the ones getting rid of the legal channels. As you just pointed out, there is no legal way for that Afghan woman who's been raped or tortured to claim asylum, especially with this new bill, which says no matter what your case, you could be an Afghan interpreter for the British military and you cannot make your case. I was on Good Morning Britain the other day with Andrew Pierce, the Daily Mail journalist. And, you know, this is the point. He's been caught on TV trying to make this argument. Say, well, if you're an interpreter, they'll be pro you'll be processed. No, don't let people gaslight you. There is no processing. Under this bill, it's automatic deportation, which is an outrage. It's criminal. It's illegal. It's immoral. It goes against everything that Britain has claimed to stand for for decades. And the fact that brown people are doing this is not just not an excuse. It makes the whole thing even worse. I mean, I, I wonder what, what you think drives that phenomenon. I mean, look, as a gay guy, I, I've met lots of, I'll be honest with you, extremely obnoxious right wing gays who vote and support or members of a conservative party which waged war against gay people for very, for a very long time. So I know it's a mentality I could at least see yeah. for, for within my own lane. But I'm wondering what you think drives that phenomenon of people who, including people who whose parents did arrive here as refugees, who people who've, who've whose family have come from all over the world. To, to kick the ladder away, if you like, or to build, to, you know, whatever metaphor the draw. Yeah, it's, again, I, I can't give you one single reason. I can only speculate, but I see and I've and I've experienced this in in Asian communities, not just with politicians, but with friends and family. I have I have people I know who I am related to who voted for Trump. I cannot get my head around that. Muslims who voted for Donald Trump, the man with the Muslim ban, 
right? So there's always going to be people, I think there's a variety of things. There's always going to be people in your community who, you know, are contrary, who go against the rest of the community. That's always the case in any community, as you said. Uh, I think there's a specific issue with immigration where there is this thing of like, well, my parents came legally. Who are all these illegal people? And buying into right-wing propaganda. Um, I also think there's that drawbridge mentality that, you know, I'm here, I'm good, no one else. Um, I also think there's a lot of racism in black and brown communities, both towards each other and to other communities. Let's just be honest about that. Um, and finally, I would say that it's just easier to kick down than to kick up. If you're on the right, right, being anti-immigrant is the same reason you're anti-poor. Like, it's the same phenomenon, right? It's much easier to kick down and kiss up. So immigration is the same as taxation. It's the same principles are driving both of your, you might be from, not just from an immigrant family, you might be from a poor immigrant family, and yet you're still in a party that is blocking immigration and passing tax cuts for the rich. It's the same phenomenon. Um, it is easier, sadly, in our politics. And to go back to human nature, we were just talking about human nature. It's easier, right? It's easier for all of us at any point in our life to go after the person below us and the person above us. And I think that's what some of us on the left have tried to push back against. And conservatives often say you're pushing back against human nature. And we're saying, well, no, not necessarily. Maybe. Oh, right. one last thing I would say very quickly is on Braverman in particular, compared to a Preeti Patel or a Rishi Sunak uh, or a Nikki Haley is, her rhetoric is not just so out there, like far right neo-Nazi rhetoric. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, Gary Lineker got battered for saying 1930s. No, it is neo-Nazi rhetoric. When she talks about invasion at our coast, that is the language of the BNP. That is the language of white supremacy. Doesn't matter if it's coming with a brown face. That is what that is, objectively. And when she says at the Conservative Party conference, I dream, I'm obsessed with seeing planes taking off to Rwanda, deporting migrants. Who dreams of that? Tell me who dreams. Of, tell me which normal person dreams about deporting immigrants, illegal or otherwise. That is almost sociopathic behavior. Yeah, like some people have a dream of the end of global poverty, the end of war. Hers is kicking some of the most marginalized people on the planet to off on a plane to Rwanda. Um, but you mentioned Gary Lineker. Um, yeah. that, to just go on the substance of, of what he said, because someone will go, look, it's one thing to criticize the horrendous policies towards migrants and refugees. But what happened... I mean, this is what Labour politicians are saying. They they start by going, well, actually, Gary Lineker is completely out of order. But when they saw the way the wind shifted, they went, oh, they shouldn't get rid of him, though. But they they did they did, they came out swinging. Said you shouldn't make these comparisons of the 1930s. That's what yeah. Labour politicians were saying. Yeah. So and 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 we know why that is. Number one, um, we know that Labour politicians are in general cautious. So there's always, you know, to come back to your point about bringing a calculator to a knife fight, it's that same principle, bringing a butter knife to a knife fight while the right brings a rocket launch or whatever analogy you want to use or metaphor. That is what they do, right? Their instinctive position is never to kind of go all out. It's always to go, oh, oh, be careful. Uh, I think on the specific issue of the 1930s, uh, I think people uh, don't quite understand the analogy. Lineker was very careful in what he said. He didn't say Holocaust. He didn't say Nazi. He said the language is not dissimilar to the language of the 30s. That again is objectively true. Uh, the language of scum, of verbin, of vermin, excuse me, of immigrants who smell, look different, don't fit in, don't assimilate, invaders. That is the language of fascism and Nazism of the 1920s and 30s. And the final point I'll make is, again, people are very uncomfortable with the Nazi stuff. You know, Godwin's law. Uh, you shouldn't always bring up the Nazis in an online argument. You remember, of course, that Godwin himself, post Charlottesville said, F it, you can call them Nazis, right? Even he said, I'm fed up. But like, actually, this is all relevant now. Um, and I think, you know, this idea that the, the Holocaust, that fascism is some kind of sealed off analogy doesn't actually make sense. A lot of people have come out, a lot of Jewish historians, academics have come out and said, no, no, the whole point is to say, when you say never again, is to understand how it happened, is to understand the path, the Auschwitz Museum. When Lindsey Graham, or when Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican, called out AOC here in America for making a 1930s analogy with the Trump border situation, the Auschwitz Museum intervened and said, hold on, actually the Holocaust didn't start with gas chambers, it started with words. It started with dehumanization and escalated to violence and exclusion and law, racist laws. So when Lineker makes that analogy, I think it's a legitimate analogy. A Holocaust survivor called Joan Salter made the analogy herself in Suella Braverman's constituency surgery, mm -hmm. Braverman refused to back down even in front of an 83-year-old Holocaust survivor, which again tells you something about her mindset. So I think Lineker was right. I'm glad the public backed him. Um, I find the BBC's behavior ridiculous, um, unjustified. The double standards are brazen. I just 
before I uh, joined this call with you, Owen, I saw David Jordan, the head of editorial policy, saying, well, Alan Sugar is different because you and I have been bringing up the Alan Sugar point a lot on social media. Lord Sugar, who called out Corbyn, made some awful remarks about Corbyn, said, vote Tory. Apparently, Sugar... Um, he didn't do it while he was presenting The Apprentice. He didn't do it while Apprentice was on air. Um, it was different for Alan Sugar. He did it in his own time as a businessman. Just, I mean, just completely unsustainable defence from the BBC. It's the same Lord Sugar who, for example, posted pictures of Jeremy Corbyn superimposed on uh, on someone being next to Adolf Hitler in in, in, yeah. in Nuremberg in a car. But no one kicks off it. <laughs> Linick has not even done one percent of the partisan and offensive tweeting that Alan Sugar has done and continues to do. Um, I want to ask you just a couple of things about the United States at the moment. Um, so, I mean, at the moment, Biden, I, I, in some sense, I think some people would say he's, he's eclipsed the expectations set yeah. um, because they were quite low, if I'm honest. Yes. Um, firstly, I, th- I want to ask you, do you think the center of gravity within the Democratic Party was shifted so decisively by the left, Bernie Sanders, who I interviewed recently, AOC, those, but I, not those figures, the movements they represented. Is that a meaningful thing? And do you think it's run out of road or do you think it's still got somewhere to go? No, I think it's definitely a meaningful thing. I think if you look at what Bernie did in 2016 and 2020, that was massive. And Elizabeth Warren in 2020. And of course, AOC in Congress and the squad more broadly, um, you know, it is fascinating that Bernie Sanders has said he won't run against Joe Biden this time round. It is fascinating that Biden has embraced Bernie and Bernie's agenda in so many ways, in a way that, you know, people have short memories. Barack Obama's people railed against the left. Barack Obama's people, uh, his press people went out and called them, I think they called them the R word. I think they said retarded, I, if I remember correctly, um, uh, deeply offensive. I think they said get drug tested if memory serves me correctly, referring to the left. So there was no kind of reaching out to the left in the way that Biden weirdly has, despite Biden having been far more to the right of the Democratic Party than Obama over the course of his career. Although many would argue Biden's never really been right or left. He's been a guy who basically sees where the party's center of gravity is and moves towards it. And as the party moved left, he moved left. This is not the Biden. This president is not the Biden of the 90s or the 80s or the 70s, clearly. I mean, we're marking the 20th anniversary of the Iraq war. Joe Biden was a gung-ho Iraq war hawk. And that's one of the reasons I criticized him so much in 2020. And yet here he is, the man who ended the Afghan war, the longest war in American history, took huge hits to his political capital to do it from the Washington establishment and did something that Barack Obama did not do. So, you know, he's clearly moved. The party's moved. And as much as we give credit to Bernie AOC, you have to give credit to the foot soldiers, to the base, to the young voters who have come in and helped push it in that direction. Again, just before I joined this call, something I saw on Twitter, there's a poll out from the University of Maryland today that really, you know, very few polls make me go, wow. There's a poll out today that shows the rank and file Democrats in this country now identify with the Palestinians more than with the Israelis for the first time ever. That's stunning. Right. That is stunning. That's another example of the Democrats moving to the left and recognizing the importance of human rights and equality in the Middle East, not just in the U.S. So I find it fascinating as the base moves is Biden moving. Obviously, there's countervailing forces. We know how many Democrats still represent moneyed interests, still represent big corporations, still represent big pharma. You have the block of Joe Manchin and people like Joe Manchin in the Senate. Look at the SVB collapse. Uh, A lot of people pointing to the Trump deregulatory law in 2018 that I think 17, 18, 17 Senate Democrats voted for. So you're still up against all of that. But look, it is a low bar. Biden has crossed that low bar. I would argue he's crossed the bar set by Obama, set by Clinton, set by Jimmy Carter, probably also set by LBJ. I think you have to go back to FDR to find a Democratic president who's actually managed to pass legislation that helps people that spends on levels we haven't seen before and has done it in the face of universal right-wing and centrist opposition. That's what I give him credit for. Is he as good as I want him to be? No. Does he need to be doing much more? Of course. But he has definitely exceeded expectations, no doubt in my mind. The other thing I wanted to ask you, maybe a bit more depressingly, well, it's not maybe, it just is. What, what do you think the chances are, if you're a betting man of Trump winning the next presidential election, or DeSantis, how, how worried we should be about the Florida uh, governor? And if so, would American democracy survive, in your view? So it is depressing. Uh, I, I stopped doing predictions after 2016 when I got Brexit wrong and Trump first time round wrong. Um, gun to my head, if I'm asked to do kind of odds, I would say 50-50, which is pretty scary when you think about it, because we live in a 50-50 country. It's a very divided society. Yes, Joe Biden beat Donald Trump by, what, 7 million votes in the popular vote? 
but we don't have a president presidential election that's based on popular vote. It's based on an electoral college, which means it's basically three states, four states max that decide everything. And it's basically around what, 70, 80, 90,000 voters in those states. So it becomes very close. If 50, 60, 70,000 votes had gone the other way in 2020, Trump would have a second term and American democracy would be over. And it will be over if he comes back. This is not hyperbole. When I said in 2019, Trump won't go. He won't leave quietly. People said to me, ah, you're mad, Brit. You don't understand America. Of course, he'll go to the Secret Service and walk him out. Everyone always goes. Well, he didn't go quietly. He incited an armed insurrection. I hate to say I told you so. But some of us warned about the democratic threat posed by Trump, the anti-democratic threat. And in t think about this, Owen. If he comes back in January 25, and we're speaking on a day where some people think he might be indicted today over the Stormy Daniels payments. We've still also got the Georgia Fulton County election case, which he could be indicted for. We've got the two special counsel investigations into January the 6th and stolen classified documents that he could be indicted for. There's multiple cases. And yet think about this, a guy who could be indicted for multiple crimes, who we all saw inside an armed insurrection, could very, 50, has a 50% chance of being president again in less than a year and a half. That's crazy. He shouldn't be anywhere near power. And if he comes back, Owen, if you're Donald Trump, you will think you're untouchable and you'll be right because you did all of that and you got elected president again and but, you're in charge and there'll be no adults in the room. There'll be no guardrails. There'll be no, you know, oh, def deferring to people in the, he will be unchallenged, uncontrollable. Uh, uh, and it will be very scary for American democracy. I don't see how American democracy survives. And no, DeSantis is not some great alternative. He's not a moderate Republican. He's basically a savvier, smarter, less charismatic Trump. But if you look at what's happening in Florida, it is basically America's Hungary. He is the all man of the United States. Ron DeSantis is a man who has used his gubernatorial power to crack down on schools, on education curricula, on libraries, on banning books, on restricting voting rights, on restricting abortion rights, on sacking prosecutors he doesn't like. Uh, this is a man, uh, you know, muzzling the free press. This is a man who is very, very authoritarian. He just doesn't shout about it on Twitter in the same way that Donald Trump used to. Um, the good thing is, that he and Trump will have a serious fight and that could actually help Biden. I think Biden's best chance is that DeSantis, Trump tear each other apart and it allows Biden to win uh, by default. Imagine if DeSantis beats Trump, Owen. You think Trump's going to accept that victory? No. Probably not. Yeah. So I, mean, I can see the Republican Party tearing itself apart, which is only a good thing. If not for the country, it's not a good thing, but at least for a prospect of a Democratic Party win is a good thing. I mean, I mean, just on the, the just quickly, finally on that. I mean, more than a poll six months ago showed that more than forty percent of Americans think civil war is likely within a decade. And even if you think about it, if Trump, if if he didn't win, would it just be the storming of the Capitol this time, or would it be something far, far more terrifying? I mean, this is a man, Owen. Oh, just just for British viewers who maybe don't quite get how extreme he's become, even by his own standards, since twenty twenty, he, you know. In 2020, he played footsie with the QAnon people and with the, the far-right militias. Now he's open. He spends his entire time on Truth Social retruthing QAnon people. He retruthed a guy who said, let's lock and load for Trump. I mean, what would we say if we saw that in another country? This is in the United States of America, a former president fomenting, inciting, encouraging political violence. And yes, people I speak to, experts are saying we are closer to a civil war than we've ever been since 1865. And they don't mean civil war as in two armies on a battlefield. No, mm. they mean civil war in sense of low level insurgency, mm. domestic terrorism, uh, political mm. violence, assassination, stuff that's already happening, right? Mm. This is already happening. We've mm. already had multiple uh, attacks in this country, far right attacks, uh, political violence. That is going to be on steroids uh, come a Trump campaign. If he wins, he has the power of the state. If he loses, as you say, does he unleash some of these mobs and militias that he basically is the leader of, de facto leader of? It's a very scary time in the United States. I'll tell you that, Owen. Very scary. Cheery. Well, just to finish, just to finish, Jackie Bonham on Patreon says, when is Medi going to come back to UK politics? Really miss his rigorous interviews and perspective on current events in recent times. Who can forget Harry Skeward, Richard Tice and Eric Prince? When are you coming back? That's what, they, that's what people want to know. Well, that's what the well, is demanding. Owen, Owen. Talk to me in January 2025. Okay. All right. That's the best we can do. Fine. I'm not going to barter with you. Um, Mehdi, it's been... I appreciate you all. I miss the UK. I was there very recently. You and I met up. I was on book tour. But you know what? It was a little bit miserable. We need a bit of hope in the UK and the US, I think. It is, it's not the, the the weather at the moment. Actually, the weather's all right at the moment. But I was going to say, things are pretty bleak at the moment, I would say. But... 
But thanks to Medi, we've, uh, I think, offered a bit of cheer. And also, it is a very, very important book in every argument. Well, can I just say very quickly, apart from yeah. plugging the book, I will say, yeah. look, the reason I wrote the book, I spent a year of my life writing this book, sharing things that I've experienced and tips that I've learned, is because I have hope, is because I believe that we can win the argument. I wouldn't have written it if I thought all bets are off, we can't convince anyone, facts don't matter anymore, everyone's in a cult. Look, a lot of people are in a cult. A lot of people don't care about facts, but there's still enough people out there who are persuadable. And I wrote the book to say, you know what? Don't let the gaslighters and the BS merchants take over our public square, take over our democracy. Let's push back. Let's let's use those rhetorical skills that are out there to push back and win the argument. I appreciate that. I like a narrative arc where we go depressing, depressing, bleak. The end and a nice tear. End on a high, as I say in the book. Chapter 16, you've got to end on a high. Let's end on a high, Owen. We've ended on a high, but it is very important that people on the left are good at debating, discussing, and of course, winning the argument. Otherwise, what's the point? So do make sure you get a copy of the book. Please like and subscribe. And thank you as ever to Medi. Cheers, Owen.